The reading from the Word today comes from Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, verses 21 through 22. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. May the Lord bless the reading of his word today. Today we're going to talk about the baptism of the Lord. And while we do that, we're going to be invited to think about our own baptisms. For some in here, you will remember when you were baptized, because it happened when you were old enough to remember. Maybe some of you don't remember that far back. Maybe some of you were baptized when you were very little, so you don't remember that. Maybe you remember your, uh, the day that you reaffirmed your baptism, when you uh, remembered it officially in service. Uh, and maybe some of you haven't been baptized at all, and you just remember watching others become baptized. But whatever your angle is, Today we're going to look at the Lord's baptism because it's that day in the church's year, calendar year, that we're called to do that. Um, we're going to talk about what the Lord's baptism meant, but also what our baptism means to us. What the act itself does for us. Our passage, as you heard read, comes from the Gospel of Luke chapter 3 today. Um, the chapter begins, this portion of it, uh, this portion of it comes right as the chapter begins with John the Baptist uh, being said to have come to fulfill the words of the prophet Isaiah who gave the prophecy of a voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain will be made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough way smooth. And all the people will see God's salvation. That was the prophecy spoken by the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years before John the Baptist came along. And we're told that John went into all the countryside and around Jordan and he began preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And you see, John was a very powerful presence at that time. And what he said, the words that he used cut people to their very hearts and and you can see that in the words just prior to the, the 15th verse that we come in on today, the third chapter. And what he said caused the people who were, who were there and were waiting for the Messiah to appear, they began to wonder if maybe John was the Messiah that they had been waiting for. But John said, no, and you heard me say it just moments ago, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who's more powerful than I. I'm not even fit to untie his shoes for him. He's going to come and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And with those sorts of words and many others, John was preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And as he was baptizing people, along comes Jesus. Along comes this long-awaited Messiah to be baptized too. And as you heard me say there as I read the word, as the prayer commenced, it says that, that he, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended, looking like a dove. And you could hear God the Father's voice ring out from heaven. You are my son whom I love, he said to Jesus. With you I am well pleased. But you see, I skipped over something. Something mentioned there in the word in between John beginning to preach and, and, the, and the baptizing going on and the baptizing of the Lord, something that happened actually after the Lord's baptism. You see, John continued to preach the good news. And he spoke about things that maybe didn't sound too good. 
good to the people who needed to hear what he had to say. We talked about some of the things that John used to say to people back during Advent, some of those scriptures we looked at together. The word tells us that John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and other evil things he had done, which led Herod to throw John in prison, as we read on in the scriptures to find out. And you, and you see, it was because John didn't shrink away from talking about the hard stuff. When he knew that it was something that needed to be done, he went ahead and he did it. He said it. You think about him in the scriptures, calling people to repentance. That means calling people to look at themselves and admit their sins before God. That's not an easy thing to do. That is not going to be received well by a lot of people. So what about you? Have you ever said something to somebody or someone that you knew ahead of time was not going to be well received? Have you ever had to do that? When was the last time that you had to say something that, that, that was unpopular, but nevertheless was true? Can you think of a time when you had to do that? What, and, and what is your inclination? Are you the kind of person that, that is inclined to do such things? Or, or are you, do you have the tendency to keep quiet? To keep the peace? And how did it make you feel later when you thought back to it and you knew that you should have spoken up, but you didn't? Have you ever reflected and found that to be the case? You know, another scene I'm reminded of concerns the one who, who is getting baptized in our passage today. You can find the story just a little bit after our passage, actually, in Luke chapter 4. And I'll get to the why of it in a, in a, in a, on another day. Actually, uh, pretty soon, here in a few weeks, I'll be talking about that. But, but what you're going to see that day, and, 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 and you can hear about it now is that Jesus was not always very well received by people. And in the scene that we're going to talk about that happens in Luke chapter 4, you see, you're going to see a bunch of people get up and, and, and they drove Jesus right out of town and they ran him up to a cliff and they were ready to throw him off of it. We talk about repercussions talking about unpopular things. That's taken to the extreme. But let's look at baptism itself for just a moment. What we see Jesus doing and, and what we today as his followers are doing. Number one is baptism points to Jesus. It points to God. It, it, it marks us as his. It, we belong to Jesus now when we do this thing called baptism. It's part of our declaration in, in our faith to be His and to follow His lead in life. When we're baptized, our lives are now connected to His life and His journey through life with us. When we receive the waters of baptism, we follow in the footsteps of many generations of other believers that have done this same thing. We confess our sins. And, our, and we confess that we need salvation and, and we need a Savior to deliver that. Who is Jesus? And, and, and we symbolize with water the cleansing of our sins and the forgiveness that we receive. Which is something that only God can do through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. We affirm our faith in Jesus, who He was, what He did. The Son of God who died on the cross for us rose again on the third day. And with the waters of baptism, whether we're immersed, sometimes we're, we're dumped when we're baptized, sometimes we're sprinkled, sometimes situations, health-wise and others, call for sprinkling. And you guys have seen me pour in baptism as well. Whether you're immersed or sprinkled, 
sprinkle the poor, we mark ourselves as his. And this act of faith represents a covenant that we make with him to faithfully follow him in our lives. And in all of it, all of it, it points to Jesus. Secondly, baptism empowers us. It initiates us. It turns us into followers of Jesus, which means we become truth tellers and good doers. It changes our moral base. It, it empowers us, if you will, to live righteously. And it initiates our ministry. That's right. We, we all have a ministry to uphold. You don't have to be a pastor in order to have a ministry. In fact, clergy like myself and laity like all of you, we're called by God to be in ministry together. Each of us has our own mission field. You've heard me talk about this before. Each of us has our own mission field beyond the church. We all have a circle that we reach into towards the people with the presence and the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. And we are empowered we're empowered to go into the mission field to make a difference. Through the presence of the Holy Spirit, who is evoked in our baptisms, we now confess and we claim the power that God gives us to live changed lives, to enact change with our lives. Does that make sense? And in those vows that we take, which are these... To accept the freedom and the power that God gives us to do what he calls us to do. We say those words in our baptism. To resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Those are more of those words that we vow in our baptism. We now have, you see, what it takes to do those things. Because of baptism. It is the power of God within us. As John said, the one who is more powerful than I will come. Remember, he said those words. And he has come. And he's present with us. And in us and through us. He changes us from the inside out. He empowers us, you see, at our baptisms. And thirdly, baptism takes us places. And sometimes those places are uncomfortable. Sometimes those places are even dangerous. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, then that means that you are on a different path now. And if where Jesus went when he was living out his earthly life among us is any indication at all, then we know that sometimes our baptisms lead us into confrontation. And conversations into things that are not fun to discuss, nor are they easy. You've probably heard of C.S. Lewis, the Christian author. He, he once said this, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. While it's easy to come to Christ, who, who is the one who does the transformative work, what he calls us to step into and use that power for is not always easy. I mentioned part of them a few moments ago, but to recall the vows that we take at our baptisms, let me refresh you again. I or another pastor says to you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? And do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Of which we answer in response, I do. And if we do that, if that is our response, if that is our vow, what do we do with that? What might that mean? Well, to build on what I last said, baptism takes us places. Sometimes fulfilling our baptismal vows 
might mean it leads us into some hot water, into some trouble, into conversations and situations that might be uncomfortable to say the least, but nevertheless are necessary. The baptismal vow mentions the freedom and the power that God gives you. And I think the implication is also the obligation that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression. Might resisting mean we've got to speak up? Might it mean we've got to take action? Maybe we thought this baptism thing was just for us, just a rite of passage or something that we do, but, but it's more than that, isn't it? Because getting baptized is a higher level of commitment to follow Jesus, to be in ministry for Him above all else. And that can lead you into some rough spots in life. Look what happened to John the Baptist. He spoke straight up truth and it led him to prison. And once there, it, 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 it took him into losing his own life. And look what, it, what happened to Jesus. Look what happened to Jesus. What might it look like for you and for me as the question to renounce wickedness and reject the evil powers of this world? To resist evil, injustice, and oppression. The implication is that these are not just attitudes alone that we have, but they include action with them. So maybe it looks like participating in boycotts or personal, demonstra uh, personal demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations. Maybe it looks like writing letters to call out evil or demand action from our representatives. Maybe it looks like refusing to buy from businesses who support things that we don't agree with. Maybe it looks like supporting causes that are working to make much needed change in the Maybe it means when you hear someone say something that's blatantly hurtful, racist, homophobic, sexist, insensitive, then you speak up and you let them know that those words aren't welcomed around you. Maybe it means that you hear somebody tearing people down in front of others and you inform them that that has no place here. Maybe it means that you hear deliberate misinformation being spread with the intent to mislead and you speak up and re refuse to let it go by without correction. Maybe it even means that you consider the viewpoints of others as you look at your own long-held beliefs and you re-examine yours to make sure that you aren't inadvertently perpetuating evil, injustice, and impression. And be humble enough to admit that maybe you've been wrong about some things. And be willing to change for the greater good. Maybe it means doing what you can to make sure that the freedoms and the powers that you enjoy in life are enjoyed by all others. Baptism, you see, is an initiation. Baptism is a launching point. Later this year, just past Easter actually, I will hold my annual uh, baptism and new membership classes. And, and, if, and if what I'm talking about today right now has, has been meaningful to you, if it's gotten you uh, feeling a tug inside to become baptized, and, 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 and maybe you want to learn more about it, then please talk to me and we will set that up. But for now... For now, those of us who've been baptized and for those of us who will be baptized, my prayer for us all is this, that the Lord will give us discernment on how to renounce wickedness and reject the evil powers of this world and to repent of those times that we fail to do so. That we will realize the freedom that we've been given, and that we will claim the power that God gives us in our baptisms. 
And we will use it to resist evil and injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. And that when we use the power that we're given to stand up, to speak up, to, to act up as we're called to. All to the glory of the one whom we are marked for in our baptisms, the one whom we now belong to, the one whom we follow, and the one whom we serve, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Let us pray. Most Holy Lord, we come to you today in remembrance of your baptism, as we remember our own. Lord, we see in your word today that your servant John the Baptist was led to stand up and speak up and act up, and we servants know that we are called similarly. So, Lord, remind us that we are marked by you to point to you, that we are empowered by you to do what it is that you call us to do, especially when we are led into places that are not comfortable. We have vowed by our baptisms to renounce wickedness, to empower us to stand up and to do that. Help us to stand up and do that. We have vowed to reject the evil powers of this world, empower us to speak to that. And Lord, we vow to resist evil, justice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. So please empower us to take action. All of your glory that is due you, and it is in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we pray these things. Amen.